So now we will hear from our fourth keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Kevin Murphy. Dr. Murphy received his Bachelor of Science in Biology from Colorado College after he spent seven years working on a, a wide range of vegetables, fruit trees, and livestock integrated farms in Arkansas, Michigan, and Washington. Motivated by his desire to develop resilient varieties of underutilized, flavorful, and nutritious crops, Kevin received his Master's of Science in 2004 and PhD in 2007 from Washington State University in organic and perennial wheat breeding. He is now an assistant professor of barley and alternative crop breeding in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University. Kevin works on breeding and agronomy of amaranth, barley, buckwheat, okra, perennial wheat, um, quinoa, spelt NTEF. He has participated in international research and extension projects in Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, and Malawi. Is currently coordinating an international quinoa breeding project in 10 countries in collaboration with the FAO. The title of his presentation today is Breeding for Nutritional and Rotational Diversity in Dryland Cereal and Seed Crops in Palusi Prairie Ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Murphy. All right, um, thank you all very much for the invitation. I was uh, part of this in Minnesota last year, and like um, Dr. Kevin said, well, one of the Dr. Kevin said earlier, um, knowing Tyler and Hannah who organized the uh, Minnesota Symposium, we are in good hands, that's the good news, and I've found that again today. It's a really great honor to be here and to talk to you all. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that title is something really to stumble over. Um, it's, it's quite long and it is accurate, that's what I'm going to talk about, but uh, it's not something you would necessarily remember. Um, I've, I wrote it and I still wouldn't remember actually what that title says. So I was inspired um, to change the title of my talk by the other speakers and one in particular, um, Irwin, whose, whose title was uh, Take Two Onions and See Me in the Morning. Um, well, I thought, how, how, what, how can I beat that? I, you know, take two cups of quinoa and see me in the morning. That's not uh, too exciting. But then, you know, so I'm a barley breeder. And I thought, well, yeah, I, I breed a lot of um, feed for animals and, and some food varieties for humans um, and some malt for humans as well. So that's, uh, you probably know where I'm going with this, but uh, I changed the title to uh, take six of these and call me in the morning. <laughs> They'd probably uh, be good chasers for the onions too. Okay, so this is where, where I'm from. I can't use this uh, pointer, but if you look to your far right, there's a little word called Palouse. And that's about, uh, represents two, 2.5 million acres of dry land farming in Washington. It, it, it goes into northern Idaho and a little bit in Oregon as well. Uh, the rainfall is anywhere between 10 and 22, 23 inches a year. Most of that's in the fall, um, winter, and spring, not much after after June 1st or so, uh, maybe a little bit, but you know, if you get a rain after June 1st, the farmers call it the million dollar rain. Um, and, uh, well, I'll, I'll keep going since I don't have a pointer, but I just wanted to show you kind of where Washington is. It's a really diverse state. It's the second most diverse state in crop production um, to California, so we grow a lot. Uh, just east of the Cascades, there's a lot of um, apples and fruit trees. We grow 75% of the country's hops in the Yakima Valley. But, but where we live, this, this picture pretty much is what we look at every day. And we're surrounded by 2 million acres of this. It's uh, beautiful rolling hills um, and primarily wheat. So w when you look at this picture, you don't necessarily think um, crop diversity right off the bat. But, but winter wheat, in particular, is the keystone crop in all of, all of, all of our rotations. And this is essentially in the little bit higher rainfall zones, anything 16 inches or higher, this is the number one rotation. A winter wheat, followed by a spring wheat, followed by a legume. Uh, legumes are chickpeas or garbs or uh, lentils or, or spring peas, all spring crops. Or it'll be summer follow. In a little bit drier areas, all it is is winter wheat 
followed by a whole year of either chemical or tillage summer follow. So uh, that, those are our, our primary rotations. Um, in, in my program, we embrace breeding for diversity. Uh, we, we, in two different ways, one as most breeders do with interspecific diversity, so breeding um, a lot of different uh, varieties of, of whatever crop we're working on or, or actually working on populations as well. A little, a little bit similar to what Irwin does. Um, and then interspecific diversity also. So that's, that picture is a little misleading because that's not part of my program, all those vegetables, but it shows that those vegetables actually do grow on the uh, Palouse as well. Um, so when I started five years ago, uh, this, is, this was my program. I was a barley breeder. Um, and this was uh, the guy standing next to me, Steve Ulrich. He was a previous barley breeder. And he retired, and, and I took his position. Um, but they almost didn't offer that position. They, they weren't sure they were going to need another barley breeder. And here's the reason why. So um, these, these numbers are a bit small, but if you look on the y-axis, that's um, barley acreage harvested from zero to um, about 1,200,000 acres is about as high as it gets in the, in the mid-80s. Um, but the, uh, the red arrow to the right uh, represents about 81,000 acres. So barley acreage had dropped so much that the Grain Commission, really the, the Wheat Commission, didn't, they weren't sure if they wanted to spend any money on barley. So that um, gave me kind of a unique opportunity to step in and say, yeah, I, I agree, we... we we do, need a, we do need a barley breeder. They, they didn't want to give up on barley, um, but maybe we can um, add some other crops as well. So this is what our uh, breeding program looks like today. And, and I uh, want to point out, so when I read the, um, I, I guess, the biography in, in the thing of, of what I do and then heard it again just now, I laughed because uh, I'm not an okra breeder. When I lived in Arkansas for eight years, nine years, I loved okra. It's probably my favorite vegetable there. But um, if you look at that top hand with actually the only thing without a seed in there, it's oca, O-C-A, and that's a, a Andean tuber. So we work on that um, and not okra. So if you're thinking okra, um, sorry to disappoint you. Actually, okra in, north, uh, in the northern part of the U.S., especially Pacific Northwest, would be Fantastic. We have grown it in a greenhouse there, and it gets about three feet tall, maybe, and puts out some okras, and that's it. You know, in Arkansas, it would be this tall, and you'd be eating it all summer. Um, so these are the crops we work on. Um, they're not matching up with what's in the hands. I couldn't figure out how to do that. But you can see uh, quite, a, quite a diversity of different crops there. Um, barley is our, our number one priority, but, but we do work with all of these, and... Um, I'll explain a little bit about them and why we do them. And it's, uh, a lot of it really has to do with uh, nutrition. It's a big part of it and then how they fit in rotations as well. Um, so I just wanted to show this. These are some pictures of the actual crops we work on. And that top middle one, um, there's some oka in there as well. So that's, that's what that looks like. Um, but you can see quinoa and amaranth and millets and buckwheat and um, perennial wheat, spelt. Um, all in there too, and barley in the middle. So just a, a, a little uh, a sidestep here. Um, when I was a grad student, one of the projects I worked on was uh, mineral concentration in wheat. And a couple questions we had were um, whether or not mineral micronutrient, in particular uh, density, increased or decreased over time in wheat varieties. And then also, was there a yield mineral concentration trade-off? So I'm just going to show a couple um, slides about those two questions. So, so this one here shows eight different minerals, uh, some micronutrients, and then calcium, um, magnesium, and phosphorus as well. And then uh, it shows historical and modern columns. And what those columns are made out of are a total of 61 spring wheats that were grown in the Pacific Northwest from about the 1850s to um, 1960s, right in there. And then it shows modern wheats as well, and, and then compares the two. And what we did was, well, we ordered them from Harold Bockelman, um, grew them out a couple of years in Pullman, 
and then um, and then grew them on the same all the same seeds on the same ground for uh, three years and compared a lot of things but one of the things we compared was these uh, concentrations of minerals and if you look in the fourth column you can see that seven out of eight of those actually decreased um, over time so again same soil same environment just just uh, varieties from different times so so that was interesting but um, you know we kind of curious why and then so if you look at the final column uh, the grain yield mineral correlation column you can see for six out of the eight there was a significantly um, a significant difference um, a significantly negative correlation there um, between yield and, and mineral concentration so that would suggest that there is a biological trade-off um, however so we, we kind of took it a step further and I'm not going to show all the slides but I'll just show one that's a little bit representative of all the minerals and and what we looked at and out of those um, all those spring wheat varieties in the northwest we primarily grow, grow hard red for bread and then soft white for pastries most of that gets exported um, and so that's what these uh, so this is copper actually here they all they all look very similar to this I'm just showing one um, but the solid line is the hard reds and the slash line is um, soft white wheats. So what we found was that uh, when, when over the years as breeders have been selecting for soft white, it's, it's not that hard a, a thing to, to select for quality wise, but it does have to be soft and it does have to be white um, and low protein. So fairly straightforward. So one of the things we select for is low ash content in, in um, soft white varieties. And that ashes are, ash was where most of the minerals are in the kernel. So what we found is that, you know, if, if we're selecting against mineral concentration it, inadvertently as it was, then yeah, there, there is a trade-off if you're doing it on purpose. But if you're, if you're not, the, like the hard reds, and this was constant across all minerals, um, there really wasn't a genetic trade-off. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I'll get back to that a little bit later. That's, uh, that, that was encouraging because really what it tells us is that we um, can and should select for mineral concentration while we select for yield as well. And so that's, that's really formula. Uh, had a formative impact on how we do our breeding in my program. We do select for yield. It is the most important thing we select for in just about every crop. Um, but we don't neglect uh, the nutritional value or the health, heart healthy traits either. Okay, so I'm back to this uh, rotation, but we'll, we'll mix it up a little bit. So, um, so really what, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, give farmers alternatives to the winter wheat well, actually to the middle one, the spring wheat part of the rotation. Um, there are issues when you follow winter wheat with a spring wheat and uh, with disease and, 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 um, and other things too, some, some wire worms, insects, whatever, whatever you, you throw out there. Uh, not, not so much weeds, but uh, diseases and insects. So, so grower, and this is really initiated by growers, they're, they're really curious and they want to try different crops so that's kind of what we're doing is trying out these crops for them make doing a lot of failures for all you uh, future plant breeders out there hopefully you're you don't mind failing because um, that'll happen quite a bit and it's actually it's a good thing it's a great way to learn but um, especially with new crops to an area um, it, it happens quite a bit so just switching it to spring barley then so uh, winter wheat spring barley um, and a legume. So I'm just going to stick with the nutrition part of, of barley. There is a, a market class of barley which is naked, so a Hollis food barley. Um, and there's a couple advantages to this. One is that normally, so when, when we eat barley, it's usually barley that has been bred for um, usually for animals really I mean that's it's feed barley and it's been pearled so that's the that's the difference there and when you pearl it depends on how it's pearled but you lose a certain amount of vitamins and minerals um, uh, 
in the purling process. So one of the reasons we're doing Hollis is so for humans is so you don't have to purl it. Um, another reason um, is the primarily beta-glucan content in, in naked barley. And so beta-glucan, it was I think in 2005 or 6 that the FDA, um, because of the beta-glucan content in barley, labeled officially barley as a heart-healthy food. Um, and it's really um, important in reducing heart disease or diabetes in humans. So it's a, it's a pretty important compound. So we, uh, we do a lot of screening for beta-glucan in all our barley lines. And this is usually what it looks like. So if we screen a thousand lines, it, it looks something like this, where we've got uh, a lot in the uh, maybe three to five range, and then anything above five, there, uh, five uh, percent beta glucan. There's not not a whole lot of genotypes there, and and when there are genotypes there, they're usually quite low yielding. This is Janet Matangihan. She's the uh, research associate in my lab, and she does all this beta glucan analysis. So this line's a little, um, may, maybe a little hard to see, but uh, that just represents yield. So as beta glucan increases, yield typically decreases. And what we're trying to do is look for lines that have high beta glucan, say six to seven percent, and a higher yield. Because again, yield is really important to us. Um, so we we were we last year we released the first food barley WSU has released um, ever. We worked with a lot of several chefs actually on this project. There's a flavor and a taste part of the project too, um, but primarily it was the yield and the um, and the increased beta glucan content that made us release it. And and we named it Havener. And uh, um, I don't know. I, I imagine. Uh, Dr. Pixley might know, but this is named after Bob Havener. And do any of you all know Bob Havener? A couple. He was the director general of CIMIT um, for a while, and then also he did some interim. He was the interim director general of um, Erie, and and then I could get the third one wrong. Siat, I think, is what it is. But uh, um, anyway, he w he was a old family friend, and um, we named it after him. Partly because uh, he's the late Bob Havener, he, he passed away from a heart attack um, several years ago. His wife Liz is still, still alive. So what's, what's important just to note about Havener, I'm comparing it in this table to Moresi, which is another Hollis line um, uh, from a private company called Westbred. And so what we did was get a quite a bit higher yield, so 400 plus pounds an acre for barley is, is pretty significant from one variety to the next. Um, and that's really what growers needed to get the motivation to actually grow a Hollis barley, because it does yield a little bit lower than hulled barley. But uh, they get, so let's say barley is $150 a ton, uh, feed barley, then malting barley might be $200 a ton, and then this food barley would be 220 a ton. So it kind of um, t makes up for the, uh, the uh, decrease in yield. But so anyway, this is higher yield. It has a um, three pounds per bushel higher test weight, which again is quite a jump. And um, the beta-glucan is essentially the same as Moresi, uh, but it's above 6%. And if you look at these the figures down below, these are all feed barleys. Um, Baroness, Lion, and Muir are all 3.5 to 3.9. So it's 50 to 75 percent higher beta glucan. And I think this is one of the, uh, I was going to save this for the last slide, but I'll probably forget. But one of the most important things um, Dr. Dr. Pixley said was uh, near the end of his talk was uh, essentially who cares, right? If this is 50 percent higher, 75 percent higher, what does that actually mean to humans who eat it? How does it help help them? And um, we don't know what we what we are doing uh, right now is um, developing a, a center for nutritional genomics at WSU where we have a, a team of breeders and soil scientists and then we actually work with a, a team of nutritionists and community the this College of Medicine um, and vet med and all them to try and figure out what this actually means 
Um, so they're doing feeding studies and, and all these as well. So it, yeah, it's important to, to ask that question. Um, all right, so now we'll get barley out and uh, look at quinoa. Uh, quinoa is quite, quite a bit different than barley and uh, farmers. So I, I've been breeding quinoa since 2010, so not very long, and, uh, but eating it since 1993. And growers in the Palouse are actually starting to grow it, and, and uh, they, they're doing a fantastic job. So when I talk about failure, we, we have had a lot of failures with quinoa due to photoperi, due to so many different uh, issues, um, heat being another one, but just so many, a ligus bug, it, the list goes on that uh, we're, we're able to share all those failures with the growers and they, they're doing a beautiful job. Just growing 20 acre patches right now and then uh, to that, to uh, the average farm size is 5,000 acres, so uh, it's it's doesn't mean much if it fails for them, but they're actually doing a, a beautiful job growing quinoa. So uh, we think that's going to um, become a more important part in the rotation in the future. Uh, so yeah, we do have a whole list of breeding objectives for quinoa. Um, seed yield, uh, the one in the picture, it's not mentioned, but weed, weed, um, well, weed suppression ability or, or something. This is actually a, a red, very red quinoa that differentiates itself from lamb's quarter, um, but there's other parts of weed resistance too that we're looking at. But drought tolerance, saponin content, early maturity, uh, pre-harvest sprouting resistance, there's uh, there's a whole, and, and salinity tolerance. Quinoa is one of the most saline tolerant crops. It actually can grow in seawater and, and make uh, seed. Um, but this this is really why it has become so popular. So um, there's there's uh, big companies, I, I know uh, some, some folks at ConAgra, for example, who have invested a lot of money trying to figure out which of these crops is going to stick around and which isn't. They're looking at all these uh, different alternative crops, and quinoa was the one they're willing to invest in because they, they believe it's going to stick around, and partly because most people like the way it tastes or, or like the way it mixes with something. Um, but this is a, another really important reason, the nutritional value, and it's the only plant that has a complete, uh, is a complete source of protein. It has the uh, levels that you need of all the 10 essential amino acids and then um, high levels of the other 10 as well. It's got high uh, micronutrient concentrations. It's got beta carotene, niacin, riboflavin, vitamin A. Uh, essential fatty acids. It's a, it's a it's a very healthy crop to eat, and so that that's part of our strategy. Is um, so at, at WSU we have three wheat breeders and and a lot of scientists who focus on wheat, and um, it's really important. That's what most growers make their their money from. So wheat wheat's really important. We're not discounting that at all, but we're trying to provide these growers with something else to put in the rotation with the winter wheat, and um, and and so. Quinoa is one of the ones they're most interested in because there's a huge market for it. And we get calls. I get emails every day, calls every day asking where can we buy quinoa. Um, it's, it's, uh, so this is one of them, uh, a former student, Adam Peterson. He's making crosses with quinoa here. Um, just I, I won't spend too much time on it, but it's a little harder than wheat and barley to make crosses with. But we still do it by emasculation. We've tried other things as well. Um, the CMS isn't complete in quinoa, so, so we're still sticking with this for the time being. Although there is a, a Texas A&M grad named Dan Packer who just joined our lab last week. He's um, spent a lot of time hybridizing sorghum, so he's got a few tricks up his sleeve he's going to show us as well. So, but our first cross is we just use morphological markers, uh, uh, seed color or flower color or things like that leaf color to make sure the crosses were successful because they were difficult to make. Um, but, but we're past that now. Um, so, so our variety trials, uh, we've grown variety trials in Utah as, as part of a group, Utah, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. Uh, about each year we grow about eight different variety trials. For three years we had 35 varieties. The next year we had 20. We, uh, the fourth year we had 20, narrowing it down a bit. Um, and I just want to show you kind of so one of the things that, that we deal with. So 
Chimicum, Washington, if you remember that map I showed you, that's on the Olympic Peninsula, so west of Seattle. Um, that's, that's one of our locations. And you can see the uh, yield there. These are just a few of the varieties I'm showing you. Titicaca is uh, a variety not out of Bolivia or Peru. It's um, out of Denmark, actually. And he got the seed. Sven Eric Jacobson got the seed from Chile. But, but he named it Titicaca. So that, that was the highest yielding in Chimicum. And it actually was also the highest yielding in Pullman, so all the way across the state. And the more we find out about this variety, it's also the highest yielding in Italy and Spain and France and um, many other places, Pakistan as well. So a lot of different places. Um, and then there's Lewiston, Idaho, which is only 30 miles from Pullman, but you drop a couple thousand feet. And in the summer, it gets to 100, 110 degrees, 115 degrees. Um, Fahrenheit and so that's that's one of the biggest issues we have to deal with is heat stress in quinoa um, and I'll, I'll get back to why that's uh, important but I'm just showing you Lewis in Idaho there it's happened in Pendleton Oregon it's happened in Logan Utah um, so so there are some challenges I have a grad student a PhD student from Ecuador who's working just on heat tolerance in quinoa um, but it, it helps drive our breeding strategies. So uh, we do have different strategies. One of them is straight up pedigree breeding. Um, uh, Brigham Young University, Jeff Mon and, and Rick Jellen have been working with quinoa genomics for 15 years or, or a little bit longer. So they, they're a great source of all these um, reels, reels that we can use. Um, and then we've been developing our own as well. And then that's a picture of uh, Julianne Kellogg. She's a master's student working on participatory breeding, um, pretty much the Sunison type model of evolutionary breeding. And then, uh, and then we are integrating a wild kinopodium species as well. So most, most people, so, so, we, uh, so quinoa is a allotetraploid, and we know what one of the ancestors is. We don't know what the second is, but the BYU folks are getting close to figuring it out. Um, but uh, there's a, a kino, the, mo, the most widely grown, well not grown, but the lamb's quarter that you see is Kinopodium album. That's a hexaploid, it's European. But then there's Kinopodium berlanderii, um, which is native to North America. And people have found that in caves in Kentucky, um, in Cahokia, and uh, those mounds outside of St. Louis. And so they have been eaten by people for a long, long time. Um, and so this, this uh, Berlandieri, uh, this is Rick Jellen. He, he goes around the country and, and harvests a bunch of it and, and sequences and figures out as much as he can about um, what, what they are and, and their um, genetic makeup. And then, and then he'll give them to David Brenner at the USDA, who's a curator for quinoa and amaranth, amaranth ACA. Um, so, so this is a, a photo on the left of one of the lines in New Mexico, and we cross that with um, with another line called QQ74, which is just straight up quinoa. So we made that cross, and this is a picture of the F1 plant. And one of the things Leo is looking at in these and other things is is pollen germination at different heat temperatures, um, acute heat stress, chronic heat stress, pollen tube growth. Um, because it, it's really when it gets hot during flowering is when um, when this uh, pollen becomes sterile, and that that's a photo of Leo down there. So um, this is really this is one of our strategies. We're not trying to make a new lamb's quarter, so this isn't going out into the field. One of the nice things about quinoa is it it doesn't become a weed. It it's light seed. It blows out the back of the combine, but it germinates right away. There's no dormancy in quinoa. There is dormancy in lamb's quarters. So, so we're going to be selecting that out, but essentially we're making, um, hopefully, some, some heat-tolerant uh, quinoa. Um, so this is Gayang Yu in the orange. She's a PhD student in food science. He does a lot of nutritional work on quinoa, uh, and use quality work on quinoa, and then flavor panels, um, sensory panels on quinoa as well, eating different things and um, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a bit of um, 
uh, project we have in Malawi, and um, and I'll get back to this then. Uh, I'll talk about Gayong's research and how that could be important there. Um, and, then, and then I just want to briefly talk about uh, Rocio. Well, actually, Juliana Norato, she's also the um, the uh, professor there. She's she's also a Texas A&M grad. But um, Rocio, on the far right, she's, uh, I, I take, this is just uh, uh, an aside, I take my grad students rafting quite a bit. And in Idaho, there are long rivers with, uh, I used to be a raft guide, so they're, we don't hire anyone. I have rafts and we go for days. Well, she got bit by a rattlesnake on the second morning and we had to helicopter her out. And for the next three days, we had no idea whether she was alive or, or dead, but it, uh, she did great. She still has the rattle and um, she turned out to not just be a great um, graduate student, um, but she's also raring to get back on the river. So um, that's kind of how we select grad students up at WSU. <laughs> Okay, so here's a photo, quinoa in Malawi. Uh, we, we work with Dr. Moses Maliro in Malawi. He's a plant breeder at the university there in a long way. Oh, he's uh, pictured in the lower left. Um, and so we know working with him that quinoa actually grows and does quite well. But another thing that was mentioned earlier um, is will people eat it, right? So we know it grows well. Uh, in, in different environments in Malawi. It's been tested at uh, many different villages, mostly with Moses. And so one student there in the middle, that's Morgan Gardner. She spent um, some time in Malawi going from village to village and cooking up the quinoa that had been grown. So they all knew what it looked like. They'd seen it, cooking it up with the women, um, no men allowed, and, and then tried to find out what they thought about it. Would they eat it actually? And um, you know, so they're very polite saying, mm, yeah, this tastes good. But um, it turns out that they actually wouldn't eat it. And the main reason wasn't because of the taste. It was because they're used to eating in Sima with their hands, which is corn-based, uh, well, corn. Um, and so uh, they, they weren't, you know, they, they, were, they weren't interested in this. And that was the primary reason. There were others, but that was the primary reason. Well, well Gayong, if you remember from the previous picture, she has identified different varieties. And much like rice, there's um, many different starches and, and whatnot in, in quinoa. And so she's found some varieties that are, are sticky quinoa varieties that actually stick together a lot better. But even then, I don't think they would eat it. So what their idea, these women had, to, had a better idea than any of us. And that was, well, we would eat it um, if we could grind it with the maize. So, um, we don't know what percent that would be, but uh, Mos Moses is working with a nutritionist there um, to try and figure all that out. So um, that's one place we have quinoa. Uh, another place uh, more recently is in Rwanda. I have a, a uh, soon-to-be PhD student, uh, Cedric, who works, who's from Rwanda, and so we have uh, several locations in Rwanda also where we're working on, on quinoa. Okay, now um, a couple of the other crops. So I have down there now prosomillet, teff, or sorghum. I put sorghum in there for Dan and uh, uh, because he's, he's thinking of getting sorghum up. And, and farmers are interested in it. But what growers are really interested in is a grass, um, just a summer C4 grass. So none of these have been traditionally grown in the, in the Northwest much at all. It's Teff is grown, but as a forage. Um, so this is what they like, just the agronomic characteristics. Again, we, ha we have to make sure they, they like all those, um, especially it's heat tolerant, short season, uh, doesn't need irrigation. So I, I don't know if I mentioned, but all those 2 million plus acres in the Palouse are not irrigated at all. It would be pretty difficult to do it, but they're, they're not irrigated. Um, and then it breaks up diseases as well. Um, so, so that's something they're really interested in. The, the, the wheats don't do that. Um, but uh, part of the marketing is that it's high in protein and iron and high in eight essential amino acids. So that's, that's one of the reasons we're really interested in it as well. And really trying to bring nutritional diversity to the field. So, so we are working with the wheat breeders on, on um, trying to get wheat to be a little more nutritious as well as much as we can. 
but we're really working on different crops. So we're not relying all on one crop for everything, but um, as, as many as we can. Um, one of the things I think about when I showed you that first circle of all the crops we work with is that's probably too many crops for uh, one program to work with. I really don't know, but uh, I go up for tenure this summer. So if, uh, if you're looking at the WSU website and don't see me there this time next year, you know it probably is too many crops, so keep that in mind. Um, so proso millet, that's something we're really excited about. Um, the growers are starting to grow that, not for bird seed, but uh, for malt, um, for gluten-free uh, breweries, which are, are starting to pop up in Seattle, Portland, and, um, and around. So, so that's another thing. Um, and it does have uh, nutritional benefits as well. Um, we're trying to, there, there's a group called Shepherd's Grain that works primarily in no-till ground, uh, actually all no-till ground, we call it direct seeding. Um, they are uh, very interested in millet. It, it does quite well in, on their farms as a rotational crop breaking up weeds, which is something they really need. And so they're trying to work in all these ways to figure out how to sell it because they like growing it. Um, and they know it's nutritious and they know it's good for other things as well. And then again, we don't know how, how long this gluten-free or, or uh, you know, where it'll go from here. Um, but for now, it, that's a pretty important reason to grow some of these. And then, so those were C4 grasses. These are some C4 broadleafs that we work with, um, or these heat tolerant broadleafs. Uh, buckwheat is, is really one that's catching on as well. Um, it is high in a couple of amino acids and then mineral content minerals as well. Um, so what's interesting is it's the only source of rutin um, among cereals and pseudo cereals, which translates into a high antioxidant um, capacity. And then it does, so farmers do like it for, um, for many different reasons. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit, but so um, this, this is a study we did in 2013 showing where we're looking at a bunch of different buckwheat varieties and, and the relationship between antioxidant antioxidants and phenolics in the different buckwheat seeds. And if you, it's probably pretty hard to see, but if you look at the bottom of all the cultivars, there's one called TA1, that's a tartary buckwheat, and the uh, free phenolics is two to three times as high as the other ones. So we're exploring that. Uh, tartary buckwheat's not the kind we normally eat, but um, it's something maybe we can take advantage of and exploit that, that uh, level of um, phenolics in there. So then these are the reasons the farmers actually like it. Um, again, it breaks up diseases and weeds especially, but insects. Um, and it's something they can just plant, get in the ground and harvest soon after. It's a great pollinator crop. Um, there's always tons of bees in them. Um, and then this is something we're starting to explore with a couple of soil scientists, but how efficient is it in um, uptake of phosphorus? We don't actually know. There, there's a couple of studies that uh, suggest um, one of them, this one I cited, that it's 10 times higher than that of spring wheat, but you know, what does that really mean um, as far as for the success of crop? That's what we're trying to figure out there too. So it could be beneficial that way, um, but we're not sure. Um, and then we are developing buckwheat varieties. Um, this is one of the crosses we've made, Deviatka by Dekul, which are uh, both from Russia. Took us two years to get to seed. They're uh, both early flowering, early maturing, and high yielding, but what's really exciting about those is they're determinate. Most buckwheats are indeterminate, so growers can, instead of swathing, can go in with a combine and just cut them. Uh, so that's, that's uh, real important to our growers. Our growers use uh, pretty large combines for everything. So they're, if they can avoid swathing, they will. Um, and then amaranth. Amaranth is another one that, uh, that, we're, that we're really interested in uh, with high protein, high lysine, um, gluten-free crop as well. And so this is one where if you can't grow quinoa because it's too hot, you can grow amaranth usually. It does a lot better in the hot areas. So we're not trying to make quinoa fit everywhere. Well, we, we're trying a little bit, but we're um, really hoping amaranth, you know, farmers will just grow what grows well in their areas. So amaranth can pick up there as well. And it's still, it's not as popular as quinoa, but it is increasing in popularity too, um, quite a bit. So we, we get calls about amaranth all the time as well. Um, 
So this is a variety called Plainsman. Has anyone, do you all grow this down here? Um, da David uh, Baltensperger. Baltensperger is the breeder of this. I don't know if he's still here, but we grow David's um, amaranth. We grow his millets. We grow a lot from David. So his stuff does really well up in the Northwest too. This, this one in particular. Um, Okay, now, so I've just been talking about what to fill in place of spring wheat. I want to finish this talk with actually kind of upending the rotation a little bit. And, and another thing that maybe grad students who want to become plant breeders can check to see whether I've made tenure or not in a year is um, having a high risk project like perennial wheat. It's, uh, it's something that is always good for a chuckle among the wheat breeders at WSU. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why. There, there's a lot of uh, challenges with perennial wheat. Um, but this is a picture of it growing in, in Pullman or outside of Pullman. Um, this is all second year perennial wheat. And this is why it's particularly of interest to growers around our... So, so growers are interested in perennial wheat. We tell them it's going to be a long ways off, but they're really interested. So this, our, our slopes are really steep. And um, you can question whether or not we should be farming on slopes that steep, but we are. So if we, that's why there's a lot of no-till now too. Um, but in Whitman County, for example, our county, uh, there's maybe 30% uh, no-till. So, so a lot of people are interested in um, perennial wheat for this reason. Um, and that's primarily due to roots. I have a grad student just looking at root structure um, in, in different perennial wheat lines and annual wheat as well. And it's quite striking, the difference in, in, uh, in the structure. This picture down here is uh, from the Land Institute, um, and it shows it's hard. You can't even see September and December, the annual wheat next to the perennial. Um, that's uh, a grass. But uh, so the differences we see aren't quite that striking between perennial wheat and annual wheat, but they're close. Um, and this is the other reason. So it's not just steep hills, but this is in the area of the Palouse called the scab land. So anything like, I don't know, 15, 14 inches of rainfall or less, there's quite a bit of it, almost a million acres. Um, this kind of erosion happens a lot. And um, this is just due to wind. So you're driving through and, and this isn't infrequent. This happens uh, definitely every year. And it blows all the wind to the Palouse or the, or the the Pullman farmers love this because they get more dirt, but uh, these growers don't appreciate it. So this picture here is taken right under that, not at the same time, but right under that dust storm. So this is a, a farmer um, in the Scablands, uh, Mark Schlesler. He's also a, a, a state representative. And so he's, um, he, he's one of the ones really interested in it. This is a field of perennial wheat. If you look closely in there, you can see a little square of annual wheat. It's a little bit shorter. A little earlier maturing, but this is what it looks like. This is, again, uh, second year. This is very low rainfall where it's growing. And so we have, there's essentially two different kind of breeding approaches. There's the, la the uh, Land Institute. Uh, well, Lee DeHaan of the Land Institute uses more of a direct domestication approach um, where, where he's just each year breeding um, within, within intermediate wheatgrass for bigger seeds and um, higher threshability, non-saturing seed, and they have this uh, variety out called Kernza, which gets better and better each year, um, but it's still quite low yielding. And then there's the way we uh, decide to go about it, which is wide hybridization. And um, it's very similar to quinoa. So um, that's, the, that's the, uh, the crosses we make, the Napyramy longatum by Triticum estivum. That's, that's sometimes how we do it. Um, and these are the traits we're looking at, essentially regrowth after harvest. Um, the one on the left, Chinese spring, uh, doesn't regrow. Chinese spring plus 4E um, does regrow. And you can also see the size of the uh, 4E is the uh, elongatum chromosome. So wheat has A, B, and D. Um, 4E is uh, um, from elongatum. So I'll just finish this off with mineral concentration because it is quite a bit higher. Um, it's been shown to be higher in Tauchii and some hexaploids, and it is as well in our perennial wheat. And this, this still could be a trade-off issue, but uh, 
as you can see, it's, it's quite a bit higher for uh, these micronutrients and on the right side for protein as well, 14, 16% compared to 11, 12. So finally, um, yeah, our, our, our essential strategy is to work with farmers to figure out what crops they want to see uh, based on agronomic um, potential. And then, and then we're really looking at agronomic potential plus nutritional value um, or heart healthy traits. Um, mixed in. So um, just w one thing we are doing which we don't have is a high throughput nutritional phenotyping service center. So that's one thing we really don't have. We can do the genomics um, but we don't have uh, any way to um, look at amino acids or protein content or micronutrient concentration or beta-glucan content on thousands of lines. So that's something we're developing right now with the wheat breeders and, and uh, other breeders at WSU is to develop this center where we can just pump a whole bunch in, um, through and, and learn as much as we can. Uh, and so that's, that's really where we think um, can fill the gap on a lot of these uh, crops is, is once we get that up and running. Okay, so that's it. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know, do we have Time for some questions? Yeah, okay, great. Well, we'd like to thank you, Dr. Murphy, for your presentation. So at this time, we will begin our question and answer session. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and our volunteers will bring you a microphone. Uh, for those on the webinar, uh, please type your question into the chat box and we will make sure that your, uh, your question gets asked. Thank you. Yes, my question is about the perennial wheat, and I was wondering what the yields per acre, what the kind of the range of the yields per acre might be from a low end to a high end, and also what might be some of the constraints that would prevent farmers from growing it in that area. Okay, um, there's two ways to talk about the the yield potential, and and one way is in in reference to what annual wheat does like the best annual wheat varieties. So, so we do have a paper out on, on some of that and another one coming, but um, depending on the perennial wheat line and the annual variety, it yields right now approximately 50 to 60% of annual wheat. So it's quite a bit lower. We have had instances of 70% or so, um, but getting, getting that across environments is a little bit tricky. Um, this is all in Washington where we're doing this. So that's one way, but um, just to give you some hard numbers uh, in, in our dry land Palouse system where maybe 20 inch rainfall zone, let's just say uh, winter wheat yields um, 110 bushels an acre. So yeah, it would be 70 maybe to 60, 60 to 70. And then, then where the scab lines are, that picture I showed you, it would be more like 15 to 20. Uh, because the yields are just a lot lower there anyway. Um, so that's about what it yields. Um, so, and that's really the biggest obstacle to farmers doing it. They love the idea, but they're not going to make money on it with that kind of yield. So uh, that's one of the obstacles. The second obstacle is uh, the second year of regrowth. We can get a, a second year yield pretty well, but after that second winter, um, uh, the, the winter survival goes drops considerably. Uh, another reason is it makes a relatively poor loaf of bread. So, um, you know, uh, that's quality, end use quality is a big issue with it. I mean, you can make, we make cookies and things like that, pastries with it all the time. It does just fine, but it doesn't have a lot of low volume to it. Not much elasticity. So it, it that's another reason. Um, and then growers have some questions and, and there's really not enough grown yet to know, but there's going to be some root disease issues. We're, we're seeing more Pythium and Rhizoctonia in our no-till wheat, um, cooler soils. And so there'll be some uh, probably root, root disease issues as well that we'll have to deal with. Um, there's a lot of reasons right now that, that it's not being grown. Um, 
and we're not looking at a short term thing here. It, it'll be more long term if it ever works. But it, it's uh, it's really we it's really fun to kind of look at the the life and death part of wheat or plants annual and perenniality, and um, we're starting to look at at where on the genome is most responsible for that and. Uh, so those kind of questions are really fun. Whether or not it ever works is is um, another issue. But scientifically, uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of questions we have that that are fun to answer or try. And then the final thing is funding. So yeah, um, we had a, a earmark for a long time in uh, the Washington State Legislature, and then one year, maybe six years ago or so, they cut out all the earmarks and so we lost our main stream of funding for it. So we piece it together now where we can. Uh, this is all this is out of Steve Jones's program initially all these lines. So he's we both work together. He's on the west side of the state, I'm on the east side of the state working on. Okay, well uh, that is actually going to be all of the time that we have for questions. I'm sure Dr. Murphy will be available to answer any more time. Thank you. Well, let's take it one more time.